Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have Andre Chaperone who's one of the top email marketing experts on the planet. His Autoresponder Madness course is the number one email marketing course endorsed by some of the biggest names in the marketing industry and it's because of the tremendous results people get with it. And I just want to tell one short story. Andre is the master at stories, which we'll get into. But I was on the phone with a friend one morning and he starts ranting about how he's the second in line. You know, he's losing this guy in this affiliate promotion with some big cash prizes. And it wasn't that he was right behind. He was a distant second. And he kept <laughs> saying, this guy is superhuman. I don't know what he's doing. He's superhuman. He's superhuman. Somehow I immediately knew, Andre, it was you. So I interrupted him. I'm like, okay. Who's this guy? Who's a superhuman person? And he said, Andre Chaperone. So, Andre, <laughs> thanks for joining me. You're welcome. Well, welcome. You froze for Good a to second. be here. You froze for a second there. I appreciate you being here. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So, I'm excited to hear your big lessons learned in the journey, what worked, what didn't work. And I always like to include a fun fact that most people don't know. What's a fun fact about you that most people do not know? Well, um, back at school, there was this dude that everybody wanted to beat him in arm wrestling. And uh, I thought I'd give it a shot. And I'd, in fact, I I'd, tried a few times and there was just no chance I was going to beat this guy. So the one day at the gym, um, I'm feeling superhuman. And I said, come on, let's go for it. I'm going to beat you. And yeah, we, we started arm wrestling. And he was obviously beating me, but I... I wasn't giving up, and suddenly, it's there was a sound that sounded like a broomstick breaking, and snapped my 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 right humerus. Your day. arm, your arm snapped. Yeah, snap, and the arm was just like sticking to, sticking out to the side. So that was a oh. that was freaky. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was a strange experience. I gotta say. That kind of goes with your your Skype. Under your Skype, you have hustle. Right? Oh right. Yeah. So why is that? Um, yeah, I guess that's just what you're going to do, right? Um, you know, you've got to hustle. You've, no one's going to be, no one's going to roll out the red, red carpet for us, right? For sure. And, you know, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about first, which is appropriate, is you're the master of open loops. When did you first discover the power of open loops? Hmm. Probably... I don't know. In two thousand and four, two thousand and five, maybe um, I started. I started doing this this whole stuff in two thousand and three. Um, I was kind of thrown into the deep end, and that's that's when it all started for me. So I don't know. It was it was a couple of years in, and I discovered it um, right about the, the same time as I learned about um, J. Abrams um, J. J. Abrams strategy of preeminence, which kind of changed and changed everything for me as well. So you know, obviously, I want people to listen to your valuable insights the whole way through. So what are one or two of your favorite open loops? And then maybe we'll close them at the end. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I, um, I don't know. It just... Um, I've, I've got some examples I can start, but then... Yeah. Uh, start with... Uh, I know I'm putting you on the spot. Um, but I know you have some really good ones. Maybe one that you've used in the past that just people were emailing, just wanting to know that answer or wanting to know the rest of the story before you were even close to finishing uh, the loop. Well, one of the things I like to do is um, if if the open loop, if it's very overt, um, they tend to work less less well when it's when it's very just by the way. Subtle. Then it yes, okay. Um, those work the best. So one of the things. Um, I wrote in an email ages ago. Um, I said um, I might show you show you the whole experiment at some point if you're interested, um, and then I just continue on. So so the so the email was just what you know it was written, and then suddenly I just added that that one line, and then I continued on again, never to mention mention it ever again, and it just drove drove people bananas. So do you have a standard time when you'll actually close the loop, or it just depends? No, it's I don't have a have a scientific formula for how I, how and when I open and close them. It's it's wherever wherever it feels natural, or whenever I want to 
disrupt something or you know really get get someone's attention okay well then at the end maybe you'll tell us about the whole experiment maybe not what it was <laughs> um what was the first version of autoresponder madness what was it like creating that and what was it the first version um was inside of my head <laughs> um so I just used to do this and it, and and it seemed it seemed like what I needed to do I just it just felt natural to me to kind of tell stories and I I just fell into I was telling stories um, through email cuz that's anything that I could do and it just seemed to work well um and I kind of honed it from there and then I got people with like close friends asking me what I was doing to, um, to get these results and I would then tell them and then it got to a point when I thought you know this is stupid. Um, I keep repeating myself to the to them in, in private. So I just started documenting what I was what I was doing on, into a document and then sharing it with them. So it kind of started like that. Yeah. It was never meant to be a course to sell. So. So what were yeah. you doing at the time that was working so well? Um, just the storytelling. I mean, I got better at explaining why it was working, or why the different things were working um, over time. As I understood things more, but in the beginning, it was it was simply just a matter of me telling stories about what I was doing, and I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I mean, for the most part, I, I didn't know that if I told a story about something, it would have this instant connection with people. Um, I figured that out later on. <laughs> did you do that stuff naturally, or did you learn it from somewhere? Um, telling stories was seemed seemed to be a natural thing to do. I mean, I wasn't good at it. So that's something that you hone over time. You know, you don't just wake up one morning and you can tell amazing stories because yeah. there's an there's an art to to storytelling. Um and I'm still learning that. So, you know, but writing any story is better than writing no story. So True. So what is the auto for people who don't know what autoresponder madness is, tell people a little bit about it. Um it's basically it's it outlines the process. So there's a few elements, and the one is a very um, the one is the actual how you strategically um, build out everything. So it's the frameworks. It's 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 all that stuff. It's 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 how you put your emails into your autoresponder and what happens when people do whatever things. And then the other element is more um, that's where you actually write. So it's more creative. Um, so, so you said storytelling is obviously so important, and you have a storytelling coach. Yeah, I do now. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I figured out that the better I become at telling stories, the more money I make. So it seemed logical at that point to <laughs> to get somebody to coach me, so I, I get even better quicker. Um, so yeah, I've I've been I've been being coached by one of the top Hollywood. Um, guys in the business. He's the same guy that uh, that works with Will Smith and uh, um, wow. some of the big names in Hollywood, including all the networks. So, yeah, he's been helping me for the last few months, and we and we just chat one, once a week. So, what's um, some of the great advice he's given you, or some one of the, the biggest, discussions? Uh, the big thing is about uh, creating conflict. Um, you know, no no story is a story unless there's some 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 sort of um, conflict. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's it. Really, you have a character. There has to be a point, you know, and then there's then there's the conflict. There's there's, there's those three elements that kind of make up a story. Um, so, what did he want to change most or uh, modify most with what you were doing? Well, yeah, um, one of the things that I, I wanted to understand more was. In what order do things happen in a story for it to be um, the most, you know, for it to work the best? Yeah. Um, because for me, everything was kind of it. Just I just wrote stuff, and you know, sometimes they worked really well, and sometimes they, they worked just okay. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really have a have a complete understanding on why something was working better than the other thing. Mm -hmm. So that was the other reason why why we hooked up is, is, is so he could help me help me understand story on a deeper level mm -hmm. so you know whenever you write an email every single email doesn't have to have this 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 complex story um but it's when you do tell a story um understanding a few of the elements and and where they go is is kind of helpful yeah 
So what are the few elements? Because I'm probably screwing this up with my interviews. <laughs> no. Well, um, you have to have a character or the hero. Yeah, which is uh, you today, but yes. Go on. <laughs> yeah, the hero. Um, and then there has to be a goal. So that hero needs to have some sort of goal or desire. Mm -hmm. And that needs to be mentioned uh, pretty early on. Um, so, so the readers know exactly what's, you know, what that person is striving towards. Um, yeah. And then you just layer on conflict, you know, along the way, because it's never, ah, uh, that's my goal and everything was just easy. And then you, then you get the goal, right? That's yeah. it never works like that. And it, it's certainly in storytelling, it, it doesn't work like that. Yeah. You have to have the conflict. So what did you have to change most after having sessions with the coach? Sometimes I used to get things in an order that wasn't ideal. So, um, in fact, one of my examples I've got on the internet, I'll, I'll share if you, if you want to share it. Um, yeah, for with sure. You. Um, so that, that original story I wrote, and there's two characters inside of it. Um, so if you go to uh, recessionproof.co, let me just double check. That's recession. Yeah, so re recessionproof.co. Okay. Um, so on that, it's a web page, but that that first page on um, that you can see was an actual email. I just put it onto the internet. Um, so that first email, when I wrote it, I had the I had the the um, evil character. Well, no, he's he's not really evil, but 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 the person that's causing some of the conflict. I had I had him up front, so he was kind of more of the hero. Uh, so we had to modify that slightly um, and make him more of the nemesis and make the hero more of the hero with with the goal. So if, if you read that page, you'll notice that, that these are two elderly people and they basically the hero and you can connect with them pr pr pretty easily. And they've got this goal. All they wanted to do was earn $2,000 a month so they can, it can supplement their, their uh, retirement. Yes, which, I, which I read this. Yes. Wrong. So, you know, it's in our story and, and it and it flows quite nicely, but you know that that was due to his help. My my first version was was less flowy. So, what did you change with the later versions of Autoresponder Manus? Because I know you, I think you have one point oh, two point oh, and three point oh, right? Yeah, the first one started off as a PDF, which was basically just evolved from that from that document that I, that I mentioned to you. Mm -hmm. um, I just yeah made it slightly easier to, uh, for normal people to understand. Um, and then the second iteration. I basically delivered the entire course as email, as a daily email. That makes sense, right? I guess. Yeah, it's an email course, so I'm going to send you emails. So it was it was really nice that um, the way that all the open loops worked because people had to get the emails every single day and they were anticipating and 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 looking forward to them, and, and that was great. Yeah. The only negative to that form of sending out um, like an eight week course um, was some people wanted to go faster. Ah, so I found that um, from the feedback, they were actually not doing any of the course, and they would wait for like eight weeks, and then they'd go back to their folder where all the all the emails were, and then they would they would plow through. I would do it. that. I would definitely do <laughs> <Yeah>. that. <laughs> so, te technology's got better now. So now I can, if I had to redo that method, um, there's a way of actually making it better. So people can actually almost um, self-pace, even though it's delivered via by email. Um, yeah, and then the third edition, I just improved it slightly, and uh, it's it's all on the internet yeah. um, as as web pages. So I could include um, inline images and stuff. And again, um, one of the things that I, I wanted to do with that one is I made it self-paced, and there's gamification included. So people are incentivized to actually move through the course. And then other parts get unlocked, so they can't actually get to those parts until they've got to certain, you know, um, the stages inside the, the the training. So, and they also had to tick off each lesson. And if they, if they didn't do that, they couldn't progress to the next one. So, all of that stuff helps engagement, and it mm -hmm. and it builds all the excitement for consuming the content in that. Were there any and other elements so, of gamification besides, so like, if they watched it, they would be able to unlock? the next uh, next session? Um, the type of gamification I used in there was very basic. Um, when I, In the next iteration, I'll make it a bit more complex. But So it, it would be 
Um, you can't get access to the private um, Facebook group until you've got mm. got got as far as lesson 19, for example. Yeah. So I told them that um, early on, so they would know that okay, there's there's this thing to look forward to. And the reason why I did that is I don't want people going to the to the private Facebook group asking stupid questions that was actually answered in the, in the product. Mm. So every Very single person smart. goes to the group, I know that they're at a point where they've consumed the the entire product and they're all on the same page. Very smart. Yeah, most. People should be doing that. That's a really good idea. They should do because people are super engaged. And I know that every single person in that forum has been through the entire course. And they're the guys that are getting results. Yeah. So how do you get – back to your storytelling, Coach. I'm intrigued by this. How do you get <laughs> someone who works with Will Smith and all these Hollywood stars? What do you say when you contact them? How did you even find them? Um. Yeah, I was – I was surprised how easy it was. Um, okay, it, it was made easier that uh, one of my good friends is also use, um, uses him, mm -hmm. so he introduced me. But um, you know, most of these guys, you can you can go to the to the web pages, and there's a little um, one of the tabs is um, coaching or consultants, you know, and you can buy an hour of their time. And I think in the internet marketing space, we're so conditioned that people charge. You know, three hundred, five hundred, even a thousand dollars an hour, and then you, then you, then you go, go, go to these people's pages, and it's like that they're only asking for a hundred dollars an hour or three hundred dollars an hour. Um, their numbers seem a lot less less than ours, so <laughs> it's very doable. So yeah, it's, it's cool. And that's uh, yeah. So I'm curious about the format. When you get on the line with them, do you have questions that you want to ask, or do you just analyze one of your emails? What's the format that you use? Yeah, we've done a bit of everything. Uh, in the beginning, I was just basically explained to him what I did. He went through the whole of autoresponder madness, so he had a, fra um, had a frame of reference. Um, so he knew that it was storytelling, but within the context of uh, marketing emails. Mm -hmm. uh, so then whenever he was helping out, he understood that I'm not trying to write a film. I'm, I'm just trying to engage with you. Um, so, yeah, so that's... And then we've, we've been through emails... Um, some of the stuff we, we, we've been through I just haven't had the time to execute on yet so I've kind of got like homework that I, I need to go and rewrite certain stories mm -hmm. that I use in my business like my backstory I don't you can't go to any page on any, any of my sites where it has my full backstory because I've always never written it because I didn't f feel like I could do it justice so now with him now when I finally do write that it's going to be like a little bit of a story yeah. um, like a movie so <laughs> tell me about it Tell me about what's your backstory. Um, well, yeah, it's just um, I was made redundant back in, in uh, 2003. So that, that story starts out e even earlier than that, actually. Um, back in 2002, we came to Marbella, um, which is in southern Spain, yes. and for a holiday. And I was just working a normal day job. The wife was working a normal day job. And we came to Marbella for the first time in our lives. And we thought, my God, this, this place is amazing. And right there and then, we uh, said to each other, we need to try and get you. Somehow, we need to try and get you. We don't know how we're going to do it because we've, we've got jobs and everybody in, in, in Spain speaks Spanish. They don't really speak English. So it's not like we, we can suddenly get, you know, get a job in, in Spain, right? So we, just, so we just came up with this random number, which was we need 100,000 pounds because that would allow us to buy like a little coffee shop. And the coffee shop would allow us to to have a little business and therefore support ourselves. And we both love coffee. So that was our like, crazy plan. And literally literally a year later, I was, I was doing the whole marketing thing online. Wow. And it all started from that. And then within four years um, later, so basically five years from when I made that 10-year that decision, um, we were living in Spain. So it only took half, half the amount of time. Wow. So yeah. It's what were of, you doing? What was your, your day job at the time? I was a... I was an IT guy, just did computer stuff. Okay. Um, I was so you were very technical. Yes, so I started off being uh, very technical, but um, since I, I left that world, I've just I don't do that stuff anymore. So <laughs> thank God that computers don't don't really break anymore. Yeah, yeah, the old sometimes. Um, I want to find out a little bit, Andre, about you and influences growing up. What was it like growing up? What was a big influence for you? I grew up back in South Africa. Um, things were things were different back then. Um, uh, 
I think when I grew up, uh, apartheid was kind of finishing, so I wasn't really exposed to that. Mm -hmm. um, but we were still um, grew up through some of that. So, yeah, um, national service was compulsory. Um, so when I left school, in theory, I was supposed to go to national service and and serve, unless I did you know, some sort of education, like went to college or university. So I just signed up for a college down the road just so I can get out of going to the army. Oh, really? Yeah. And six months in, um, the army was was made um, voluntary after that. So I dodged the bullet. And yeah, then I just kind of, a friend of mine, we were just like hustlers. So um, we started buying um, things from um, news, newspaper ads, just buying stuff and trying to figure out ways of, 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 of earning money. <laughs> so. The whole information marketing thing actually started back then using uh, classified ads. What were you buying? Um, this one lady was selling, you know, how to make money from from home, right? Basically, the the normal pitch. And when we um, when we got it, it was basically just a little thing, which I still have somewhere. Um, she says basically, you just figure out how to help somebody. So it's a how to guide. So how to f stop a dog from from barking or, or whatever. And you would write that into a document, and then you would buy um, ads and advertise that you have a solution for 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 a dog barking problem, for example. Mm -hmm. And if you get money getting get sent to you, you would stick in an envelope the the how to guide and post it off, right? It was kind of what we do nowadays. It's just it was offline instead of online. Mm -hmm. So, uh, where did you get your entrepreneurial spirit? What did your parents do? Um. My father was worked in a hospital for entire, his entire life until he retired, um, early retirement. But, um, he just started right at the bottom doing whatever you, you did when you first get employed. As in, I think he was, he was 17 at the time. And then he just worked, worked his way up to well, one of the directors of, of that um, thing. So um, that's what he did. Um, and my mom just just worked for her brother. Um, they had a um, a steel manufacturing business where they did um, steel furniture. Um, so she was kind of just like the secretary, do it all person, bookkeeper, everything type person. So I I didn't really have an entrepreneurial background at all. It was just kind no, of no. But you had that spirit, you know. You're checking the yeah. classified ads. Where where did that come from? You think? I just knew that um, I would that I wanted to work for myself at some point, and I. I had that that belief that was going to happen. I didn't know how. I just knew. I just felt that I wasn't going to be the type of person that was going to sit in a cubicle for the rest of their life until they hit the age of 60 and then they're going to retire. Right. Why not? I mean, because most people don't think like that. So what was no, it about? I think just some people are just wired differently. It just yeah. nothing scared me more than than the thought of sitting in a cubicle doing the same thing every day or getting um, – um, getting fired and then having to find a new job and then for that whole cycle to continue until the day that you decided that you um, you were you were worthless and you had to go and retire. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, what was the early days like, Andre, when you first got started into you know the internet after your? Or I guess you said your job was made redundant. What happened? Was it something that you had transitioned to, or what happened with that? Well, we were in this, in this company, it was the beginning of 2003, and we heard from the grapevine in the January of that year that we were all going to probably lose our jobs um, come Christmas time. Wow. Because um, they started, they wanted to to, to sell, uh, basically get bought out, so we knew that we were all going to be replaceable at some point because the company that was going to buy them was a big monster company, and they had their own staff, right? So our assumption was we were all going to get the bullet. Plus, they were busy outsourcing IT stuff, uh, stuff to India and that. So, yeah, we all became replaceable. So everybody else started looking for for new jobs. So when they finally got made redundant, they could then move into their new positions in other companies. And I thought uh, I just um, I just decided to myself I need to do something else. I don't want to keep doing this anymore. It was just a conscious decision. So. I knew I had until the end of the year to try and find something, mm -hmm. and that's when I started looking. I, I started looking, and I didn't know what I was going to do, and I, I, I just ended up online searching, and I found eBay, and then I saw people were making selling information on um, on eBay, and then I, I ran into a, a guy that Frank Kern was selling at the time called Infomillionaire, 
And I bought that and it blew my mind. I thought, oh, jeez, I, I, I had no idea you could actually sell information online. So that's how the whole thing started. And then, but unfortunately, I was, I was made redundant in October, so oh. a few months earlier. So it, it doesn't matter. I was, yeah, it was the happiest day of my life, really. <laughs> so what did you do to start day. then? Well, um, it, was, it was just, okay, I, I know what I, what I need to do and I just had to hustle and figure it out. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, it was tough. Um, I was lucky enough to to start making money from from the very first month, but it but it wasn't much. And yeah, that was back in two thousand three, where it was more more like the uh, Wild West online. So you know, you kind of did all sorts of different things. And yes, yeah, so over, over the next two years, I basically been through everything. I was I'd done you know SEO, paid um, article marketing. Um, um, and now I'm an introvert, so I don't do well speaking to people, you know, like we are now. <laughs> I never you, used to do. <laughs> you seem like a natural to me. So when I when I found email, it was like the perfect fit because I'm an introvert. All I need to do is like type things, and I can communicate with an entire audience and connect with them. So it was like it it was the perfect platform for me. Yeah, I mean, I would think you know, people see you now, and they're like, wow. You know, Andre's got it. But I remember reading a uh, something you wrote and said you said the first two years of going this crazy stuff was tough. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Yeah. What was yeah. it like? I mean, I, I know you say it was tough. What was it like? Because it's not easy at that time. No, and I've actually forgotten most of it. But um, I just remember that it was it was tough, and I was constantly thinking about money. Like, oh, I just need X amount to pay the bills or X amount to do whatever. I was lucky enough that my wife still had a normal job, so she kind of supplemented things um, early on. Um, so yeah, but every single month, it kind of like crept up. They got slightly better, slightly better, slightly better. But some months, I thought I was going to get brain damage because I was just doing stupid things and I was doing it all myself because I didn't um, have the money to outsource it so when I was doing SEO and, and article marketing I was building these sites I wrote every single word of those sites all myself and mm -hmm. that's like that's not what you you're supposed to outsource that stuff right <laughs> well I guess that's how you learn right <laughs> yeah yeah so that's those are all, all the mistakes I made doing everything myself you know, I was going to ask too later on, but I guess now, what are some of the big mistakes that you made that you learned a lot from? Um, one of the obvious ones is doing everything and not understanding what my core competency is and then just focusing on that and for the most part trying to outsource everything else. Mm -hmm. So I just got stuck in the minutiae of doing the things that aren't revenue generating, you know, like building web pages and creating ebook covers this, that stuff doesn't make you money mm -hmm. per se but um, so but when you were when you when you're hustling and doing it all yourself um, in my mind that was the only way way I had to do things right so yeah eventually I, I got wiser <laughs> and started earning more money so I could outsource or well, learn how to outsource stuff and the, you know Andre that's a good point you know people sometimes don't know what their core competency is so how did yeah. you come to that in 2006, um, I got exposed to Rich Efren's stuff, and um, um, I flew to um, Florida, and he had a seminar on, and at that seminar, he taught us, um, I forget what, what the product is called now, um, but it's basically his one where he, where he teaches you about understanding what your core competencies are, okay. and that's what you want to focus on. So that was kind of one of the uh, turning points early on. So what did you discover at the time? What was your core competency? Um, writing and yeah, just just you know, writing, um, creating content. So stuff like like emails, it's an asset. And um, whenever I write an email, I don't ever write that, that that email and it and it only ever gets used once. Whenever I write something, that which is why I can, I don't get stressed out if it takes me a day to write one email. Because that's still time well invested. That the one email is going to make me a lot of money over the next few weeks, months, and years. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the way that that I look at it. I was, I was speaking to a friend the other day, and he's got a he's got a, a course on on guest blogging, and 
he says he he can spend twenty hours doing well back in the day, and, and this is what he teaches: twenty hours to do one one guest post, which seems like a huge amount of time, right? Yeah. But those things are assets that that live on the internet, and they just bring new traffic and mm-hmm. and make it money. So, but not everybody sees that. They'll say, "Okay, I'm going to do guest blogging," and they'll go and get somebody to write an article for for five dollars, and then wonder why it doesn't work. Right. Yeah, it's going to stay on there for the life of whatever that web page is, is alive. What was another big turning point for you, Andre? I know that you said, um, I also read 2006, you said it was when my income moved to a completely new level. Yeah, that was, yeah, in 2006, um, I had committed to promoting a product for um, for a guy that I'd met back, back in London. Um, he's also a British guy. And we just met at a pub and we chatted. There was a few marketers, and he said that he's bringing out this new product, um, and it just it just seemed like an amazing opportunity. The product it, it seemed so different to all the other stuff that was that was getting pimped. So I said, "Yeah, sure, I'll promote that." Um, and the, and then he said, "Well, it's a thousand dollar product, and I'd only ever promoted something like up to the value of maybe two hundred dollars max. I um, mean, you know, most things in in those days was sixty seven dollars." Forty nine dollars. It was, it, 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 you know. So um, I ended up going to Las Vegas because my my wife um, had a job at Party Poker um, at the time, oh, the world's nice. largest, yeah, gambling thing. So they were all sent to to a conference in in Las Vegas. So I just kind of tagged along, um, and yeah, I just spent my time in the hotel room in the win writing these emails, and I, I just wrote in a far more intense way because I thought, how, ma- how the hell am I going to sell this product that cost $1,000? And I've only got a tiny little list. I, mean, I think the list at the time was less than 1,000 people, um, which is insane, right? And yeah, <laughs> I just I just wrote, and it, it, that, was, that, that promotion just killed it, and I was number one affiliate, uh, and I beat uh, Rich Efren, and wow. I... And I couldn't believe it, so I kind of reverse engineered what I was doing, and yeah, that's kind of one of the big turning points. So, how many did you end up selling? Um, I think I sold 124 copies. Wow. Yeah. 124 thousand dollars. Yeah, well, I, I got 50 percent of that, so right. it's still it was like a 70 thousand dollar month that month, um, and it was like my biggest month by far. So <laughs> it was. So that was cool, but then it, it was literally um, as I did that. Then those were the type of results that I was getting uh, more regularly, and every single thing that I promoted, I, I seemed to be in the top position or 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 thereabouts. So it was kind of like a fun a, a, a fun pro, a process that I was going through. So even then, with the because you have another website, it's it's tiny. What's the website? Um, yeah, there's there's a few of them. Uh, tiny little businesses. Um, is one um, that that's one I have with a partner, Steve Gray. So, at that time, with the small list, were you just employing your storytelling emails, or what were you doing then? Yeah, I was employing my storytelling emails, and I was going above what everybody else does. So, I had um, short feedback loops in all the emails that I was sending out. So, I knew people. I was trying to put myself in their place, right? They're getting exposed to this, what sounds like an amazing opportunity, but it's going to cost $1,000, which at the time was a lot of money, um, still is. So I just knew if I was them, I'd want to know certain things and I'd want to understand if it is. So I basically had a dialogue with people through email. Mm. So, you know, I was asking them for their feedback. They were emailing. I was responding straight away. And, and there was this to and fro that was happening over the course of that pre-launch and then and then launch, um, they that was abnormal at the time. You know, um, guru marketers and, and people don't respond to emails. So um, yeah, so there was a big connection that that happened between myself and and my small little audience, and it, it obviously works. So what were some of the responses you're getting that allowed you to change course or add things? I can't remember the details. Um, I wish I did, um, but yeah, I just, but basically questions and then answering the questions and then those, what they were asking, if there were if there were enough people asking the same thing, that would essentially become my next email. So I would then address that in the next email. So mm-hmm. quite a few of the emails turned into a Q and A, but then it was me 
interweaving my story. You know, I said, you know, I'm here in Las Vegas and I'm writing this over here. So they had a picture of where I was, what I was doing, and I was responding to them. So, yeah, it just it created that, that bond and connection that they hadn't experienced before. Yeah. So, Andre, what do you do now to get inside the minds of, of the prospects and buyers? Um, ask lots of questions. Always have feedback loops in all your emails. Um, we do all of that stuff because, yeah, it's just, um, it's just understanding where they are, what they want, what, what their desires are and how you can help them get there. Um, so, you know, for instance, um, we have, we, we typically have automated um, um, surveys. So we'll have a poll daily survey. Um, every single person that, that goes into tiny little businesses, as soon as they buy, that very next email is, um, thanks for buying and everything, but um, I'd love to know what made you purchase? And, I'll, and, we'll, and we'll ask them, what 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 one word or thing did we say on our website mm -hmm. that made you buy? Um, and then one of the other questions is, did you know me? Yes or no? Because obviously that that's an, uh, a factor. Mm -hmm. So it's just understanding that it, if somebody didn't know me um, already, um, if they weren't referred, you know what was that that phrase? And most of them will say for that site, it's it's because it seems so genuine and different. There's no harp, there's no hoopla, none of that stuff. So we know that that angle is working really well to to attract that type of person. So, yeah, you just ask lots of questions and the more insights you have, the person, the business that has the most, that understands their customers the most, the one that wins. So, mm -hmm. so what's this, you know, obviously you sent out a lot of surveys. What's a response you've gotten that has surprised you the most? Um, the one that happened uh, not too long ago, actually, um, so for our tiny little businesses business, we have a we have a thirty day um, prospect sequence. So it basically takes them along this whole journey, um, one email every single day for a month. And he had responded to one of those emails where I was asking for for people to to respond. And he just he he wrote back this email that uh, the guy said he, he was crying writing it. So it was a very emotional email, hmm. and I just thought, wow, this is the most amazing email. So I responded to the guy, and, and, and he obviously didn't expect anybody to respond. He just he was just hitting respond because he was so frustrated. He was working in this pizza joint. He had tried all sorts of things. He just couldn't. He just couldn't couldn't do it. So yeah, I, I responded to him. He was blown away, and we had a dialogue. And and after that, I said, you know, you've you've got a you've got a great way with with words. And just so happened at the time, Mind Valley were, were recruiting copywriters um, and they had this little um, thing going. And it was like literally four days before that was going to close. I said, you should go and apply. So he went and applied. He actually got the job, wow. but then he, then he turned it down. Um, but he's, he's completely changed since then. So wow. yeah, just, so he now, he's now an apprentice for one of the biggest copywriting dudes out there now and he's his whole trajectory has changed now just from that having that that one-on-one -on -one conversation with the guy yeah. that's amazing yeah yeah so the power of email the power of story i guess yeah it's the power of, of just of just of just giving a shit right because yeah. they don't expect people to reply so if you if you can do that even if you don't reply to every single email, because you obviously can't reply to every single damn email, yeah. but um, I still get to reply to all the all the all the ones that actually mean something. Yeah, yeah. So, how do you budget your time? Because you probably get so many emails, you have so much stuff going on, you have a lot, you have so many websites. I mean, I checked out I probably almost every single one of them to prepare <laughs> for this. Um, what do you do to budget your time and for you know productivity? That's been a challenge, actually. Uh, I'm a, I'm a ADHD, ADD, crazy. I find it very difficult to focus, and so time has always been the one, the one, the one resource that I've never been able to manage manage very well. So, I've tried everything. I've tried every single electronic version of things, mm -hmm. notes, to dos, to dars. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, still the one thing that that um, still is the thing that, that I go back to. I have a 
have a notebook that looks like this. And every, every single, so this is for this week, this one here. And it's basically just just the most important things that I need to do yeah. um, on it with a little, a little, like a little box. And then I get to cross things off. And I love crossing things off, yeah. I love things, uh, doing that as well. And it's only the most important things that are on there. And so, yeah, so I know that at the course of, when a, once that week's finished and I've crossed these things off, I've, I've moved closer. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, I just found that that just doing that that simple act um, has has helped, and also understanding what makes you distracted. Um, I've had to mm. get more ruthless at turning off Skype, turning off Facebook, turning off email during the day while I'm working. Because again, any excuse, you know, I don't know if you if you read the book, um, do the work, and turning pro, but. Um, there's that. Yeah, there's the a, Stephen Pressfield wrote one of them. That's books? right. Yep, yes, yep. Mm-hmm. talking about resistance. Yes, really that good. Book, that book just basically slapped me across the head. It was, it was so brilliant. It was like ah, resistance. That's, the, that's the thing. I'm, I'm looking for any excuse not to do the work that I need to do because the work's quite, quite difficult. So, yeah. <laughs> so just what's yeah. on the to do list this week? What's the main priority? The main priority is um, rewriting the Order Point of Madness sales copy. It's a and, huge. Um, undertaking right it's a massive undertaking and i'm not a copywriter people think i'm a copywriter because i write good emails yeah i'm not a trained copywriter i don't i can't write sales copy like traditional copywriters do so i find it massively challenging so i'm i'm working my way through that at the moment i mean i remember because i when i asked them like "Uh, andre i'm doing this legends of direct response copywriting I want to interview you, and you're like, no, I'm not a copywriter. I'm like, no, I, and I come back, no, I mean, we'll talk all about email, but, you know, it all ties in. Yeah. You know, it's, a, it's just, you know, everyone, it's not like a technical copywriter, but it's a form of copywriting. Yeah, I know. It's, it's strange because you can get people that are, are brilliant um, copywriters, um, um, Agora, um, come, come to our little um, private mastermind that we do um, two or three times a year. So they're a client of ours, and they, that company has like more of the, you know, some of the best copywriters in the world. Mm-hmm. And their biggest issue is is they can't find people that can write decent emails. So they can write sales copy all day long. It's just mm-hmm. when it comes to writing an email, they 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 fall down. They, it's just it's What's different. It is very different. So I'm kind of the other way around. I can write decent emails. I just battle to write the other stuff. So where do you start? You want to, to redo the copy. Where do you start with that? Well, my starting point is the previous iterations of the pages. Um, so that's that's my starting point, really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do you bring on like a copywriting coach or do you just kind of go back to what you talk with your, your storytelling coach about and improve it? I've got lots of, lots of uh, proper copywriting friends. So um, as soon as I'm done with, with the first iteration, I'm going to run it past a few of them mm-hmm. and just iterate from there really. Yeah. Um, I've, I've paid a copywriter to, to create one of my letters once upon a time. It just doesn't come out right um, because people know me for the way my my laid back way of writing, mm-hmm. and you can tell from all of my websites. If you go to Frank versus Matt, um, uh, you can see that it's 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 written in a very different way. So as soon as a quote unquote proper copywriter wrote my sales page once upon a time, it came across as a it's been written from a copywriter and not people from me. People could detect it wasn't your voice type of thing. Yeah, so now I'm trying to find that that balance. (laughs) So what's some of the most successful campaigns that you've written and why they were so effective? Um, Well, the first successful one was that one in in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. Um, And everyone's everyone's unique. Every single single promotion is different. Um, Even the one that I I, I did last, the one that... um, um, where, where Brad Brad was uh, moaning because he couldn't catch me. <laughs> um, they kind of just evolve. Um, I have an idea of of the direction. The biggest the biggest issue the biggest thing is, is is the hook coming up with the hook, and then everything kind of goes from there. 
um, the most successful thing. I, I don't know. They they all kind of work well. I mean, you had the memorable one, obviously, with the thousand dollar product, right? Mm. What was another memorable one for you? Because at that point, it was like. Wow, I've never promoted a thousand dollar product. What was another milestone moment for you in your career? Um, it's funny because every single promotion has its own little um, wins and rewards, mm -hmm. um, um, separate from the from the obviously the the uh, financial part of it. But like for this one, for example, is I got to meet Brad. I mean, I I never knew of the guy before. And I love meeting new people, even though I'm an introvert. It's you know we 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 operate in our little bubbles over here. Right. We don't really connect with people, so it's it's nice to expand our our sphere of influence. And so it was great meeting him. In fact, I'm I'm flying out to Baltimore next next month to hang out at the at the mastermind event for the top ten. And I'm looking forward to meeting the guy. Cool. He's um, awesome, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. So nice. And yeah, through these things, I just meet new people. And like um, I met Todd Brown on the on the launch before that. Um, then I went to Miami and um, and I met him in person for the first time, and and that was awesome. And and it's just meeting people it is a nice byproduct of yeah. of becoming successful. For sure. I mean, you're all the way in Spain. How often do you come to the U.S.? Um, probably too much. Um, I don't really. I'm not a fan of traveling. I like I like it when I'm there. I just don't like that the actual act of traveling. Um, I don't like flying. I don't like all the queues. I don't like it, any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but because of um, our Oceans Four thing that we do, um, I kind of have to have to go to the states at least three times a year. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, that looked like a cool event. Tell me about that. Yeah, it is. It, it, it was just um, I think Ben or or Ryan. It, it was their idea once, um, and they just said, you know, let's. Let's try something like this, and uh, it just turned into Oceans Four because there's there's four of us, and we we kind of bolted it onto the onto the side of um, Ryan Dice and Perry Belcher's email world last year, in I think it was September two thousand three uh, uh, thirteen. So we decided to well, people don't go to that anyway, so maybe we can just leverage that. So we just connected with our list and said, uh, we decided we we going to be doing this this very small mastermind, five people maximum. Um, it, it's really expensive, but it's going to be worth your while. Um, so we managed to sell that out, and it went really well. So we decided to do it again and again. Um, so we we going to the fourth one, I think, in in um, October. Yeah, I talked to last week. I just happened to talk to Dan. You know, I interviewed Ben, so he had mentioned um, the Oceans uh, cruise, and then I talked to Dan, who attended, and he just was raving about it. Oh yeah, Dan. Dan's awesome. Oh, which Dan? Dan Meredith. <laughs> okay. Yes, uh, the guy's crazy. He, uh, yeah. <laughs> How so? <laughs> yeah, he's just nuts. You should meet him in person. I don't know if you've uh, met the guy in person, but yeah, he's 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 like a big cuddly bear. <laughs> he looks like it. Um, so, what's one of the best things that's come out of the the oceans? Uh, it's just connecting with with other people on a very high level. Um, uh, they're all super successful, but they still come and they're still wanting to learn. You know, um, Agora, I don't know, they must do between two and five hundred thousand dollars a year. I mean, that's like half a billion dollars a year of business. Uh, yet they they still come along and they learn from um, from us mm -hmm. and from others in, in in the mastermind. So nobody knows everything. Yeah. You can always learn more. For so. sure. So what was a big breakthrough? That you remember that someone had. Um. Well, Ben Settle and myself are the email guys, so we we kind of give insights to email stuff. But then Ben operates email differently to, to the way I do it, so it's it's a nice contrast. Um, again, you know, there's there's no one right way to do any of this stuff. You know, mm -hmm. my method isn't the only way. It's not necessarily the right way, and and the same with Ben Ben's approach. So it's just they get to see a nice contrast um, and typically which is good for us is almost everybody does email pretty badly so so there's always wins to be made <laughs> um, and then Ryan Levesque is like a crazy um, funnel guy and copy guy and 
Um, so he, he he goes really deep into the psychology, and the guy's he's he's got a neuroscience degree or something like that. So um, yeah, some of his 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 things and his survey funnel stuff is great, and people people love that. So Andre, what's the most common mistakes you see people making with email? There's lots of things. <laughs> Um, one of the things, um, it, it's an easy one to fix. Um, I find we find people are asking for too many things in in an email. So they'll there's no one clear focus. There's no one clear call to action. They, you know, go here. There's like links that go all over the show, or they're asking people to do different things. So step one, I, I need you to go and do this, and then there's a link. Right. Step two, now now you need to go and do this other thing, and uh, Go register here and then do this. There's just too many things going on. So, uh, one of the golden rules is is you know every email it needs to have one focus and just one call to action. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Yeah. What's another good one that people are doing that's really common? Common one. Um, let me see here. I'm just looking at at a document I wrote uh, for Mind Valley. Um, Talk to the right audience. Be interesting. Uh, segment, yeah. Um, segmentation is something that lots of people don't do. I know that, and it's 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 one of my big big secret things is, or the reasons for me doing so well, and the way that I can compete and beat people who have bigger lists than I have, um, is because I segment like like a madman. And so I'm, I always know that when I'm speaking to a to a segment of an audience, that that offer is super related to them. Mm -hmm. um, so so segmenting. how do you go about segmenting? Um, I do it in a in a unique way. I mean, people have have cottoned onto it now, so there's more more people doing doing it, which is good. Um, but it's like a behavioral. Um, stuff. So you would have a sequence of emails, and within the context of those emails, people would be um, clicking links, for example. So if somebody clicked on a link about a certain topic, it kind of tells you that they're interested in a certain thing. And if you if you want, you can then launch another series of emails that would then trigger something else, or it'll just you can tag them for later use. Um, but for the most part, people don't do that. That they just send out broadcast emails and then. And they'll target the entire list, and then the next day they'll send out another broadcast email to target the whole list. And there's they aren't doing any of the segmenting stuff. And you know, not not a hundred percent of those people are going to be wanting to listen to that to that particular email or that top, topic, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely guilty of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's just uh, segmenting takes takes time and effort, yeah, right? Yeah. So there's a learning curve that. And then there's the technology, which is which is a which is a which is a barrier as well. Mm -hmm. So you got to figure that stuff out, um, which is why people pe people don't do it, which is fine for me. It allows me to to yeah. compete really nicely. Yeah, there's there's work involved, a lot of work involved. Yeah, um, although technology is getting a lot better now, so you know most of the, the 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 solutions now can can do most of the stuff now just out the box. What kind of technology would you recommend people looking at? Um, well, I'm definitely not going to re recommend Confusionsoft, but um, their technology, <laughs> Confusion yeah, their, their technology does allow you to do all that stuff, all the tagging, and everything. It's just um, I used them for six months, and it was a nightmare. And that was that was a few years ago. Um, so I, I don't necessarily want to want to knock them, but I think every single person I've spoken to that has joined them is just like can't wait to leave. Um, so Office Autopilot is another one that's 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 pretty good. It, it does all the it has all the bells and whistles. But some of those those solutions you kind of have to pay for everything. You can't just if you just want to be an email marketer and yeah. not have to worry about shopping carts, you you kind of get lumped in with the whole thing. So it's, mm -hmm. it becomes expensive. Um, yeah, but there's there's just so many services out there. In fact, we're going to have our own one in October. Oh, nice! Really? Basically, built for Autos Wonder Madness. Wow, that's so, a big undertaking. Well, um, my partner, this um, this German guy, has had it in the German space for since two thousand and nine. So we actually partnered up to bring it to the English market. So, so the actual technology itself has existed for a while, and, and he's and he's been developing that ever since. So, 
it's it's rock solid. We just need to bring it, um, translate it, turn it into English, mm. um, build out all the mail servers, which is a nightmare. But that's not <laughs> my job. That's that's what he does. So, can you talk about what? Where is it going to be? Where can people find it when it comes out? Um. Yeah, it's uh, October is our ETA to to, um, to bring it to um, a small group of people. It's coming up. Yeah, it's it's coming up soon. So, <laughs> um, mailfluence.org is kind of the, the little landing page to okay. if you're interested. Okay. Um, there's just a waiting list on there. Yeah. Nandri, you know, we talked about a lot of successes. I know not everything's a success. What are some campaigns that didn't do well? And why do you think? Um, it's less the campaigns and more sometimes the, um, the actual email of what, what you've said. Okay. Um, I, tr- um, I try and polarize my, my messages a lot because if you're kind of trying to s- sit in the middle all the time, then you don't really pick up um, the type of people that you want. Excuse me. So, um, yeah, just sometimes I'll, I'll write something that resonates with people the wrong way. Um, like what? <laughs> um, well, actually, recently I, I sent out an email and, and the actual lead in for the email was I was watching um, a program on TV and called Dra- uh, Dragon's Den. It's, it's kind of yeah, like... Yeah, I read your email on that. Yeah, oh, I like did? Dragon's Den. Yeah. Yes, yes. It's, it's a good email. It's just... I didn't give all the facts on purpose um, on the actual lead-in, um, but the way that I'd worded it, I wasn't. Um, what was I didn't wrong say, with that email? It was the lady with the marshmallow business, right? That's right, the marshmallow business. Yeah. Well, and then I said, I said um, she eventually. Um, um, uh, how did I word it? Uh, that she didn't accept any, or she didn't. She left with a, with a, with a no investment. I think that's that's how I worded it, which right. is exactly what happened. Right. But but the true thing is, she actually did get two two offers. It's just they wanted so much money. She said, "No, I'm not willing to do that." Um, but I just didn't for, for that email. It wasn't about that program and that. And I just felt that that was going to make the email and that whole intro too big and bulky. And but so I just kind of left out those bits. And one one guy responded to me this huge big response saying that it's like I was comparing apples and oranges together so um, <laughs> but that that campaign is actually working really well so you know it, it's it's it was it was obviously written in a way that almost everybody enjoyed it but it pissed off one, one person that watched it and thought no nah, I haven't told him the whole story so what's a, what's another email when you broke it down of why it didn't work like you wanted it to um like what's one you broke down maybe with your you probably brought one to your story coach you're like why did this not work I don't know I actually haven't um, I tend to focus on the stuff that um, w- that does well mm-hmm. or things that I need to know um, I don't really um, half on about failures too much um, in fact all the biggest ones is is when there's there's been a there's been a mismatch where I've not understood um, the needs of of the market mm-hmm. uh, deep enough, and that's pretty much where you'll get. We well, you don't fail per se, but you just don't get the actual result because you your assumption was different to what reality was, and mm-hmm. um, which is why I, I do such a thorough job on. Always, I try, try, not, try my best to understand um, the audience. But sometimes, when you go go into a new market and you don't know know the audience that well, and you make some assumptions early on, um, the wins are quite small until you get to a point. And as you understand that audience more and more and more, you can you can you can change those things, and then things just work better. Yeah, so it's you just get deeper in the mind of what people want. Yeah, I mean, it. Everybody. Um, experiences that you know, no one can go into a brand new market and then just start, just start killing it, right? right. It's it's a process. Yeah. So, what was one for you? Um, I don't know specific. Actually, um, we were uh, for a case study that, that that I was doing. Um, my friend, my my business partner, and myself went into the to promote a weight loss product, a paleo weight loss product to women. Um, so we decided to target elderly women um, over the age of fifty. So 
yeah, we just had to make a lot of assumptions early on because I'm not a woman and I'm not over 50 and <laughs> <laughs> and I don't have those those, those issues. So um, I kind of modeled it on my mother who, who is part of that, that audience. Mm-hmm. So I kind of interviewed her, um, but she's just one person. So, so the first iteration was basically me telling her story um, and then we just we just changed from there. But yeah, early on, it's like it's it's strange because you can you can create this thing and then send traffic at it, and then there's like crickets. <laughs> it's kind frustrating. Of think, it's frustrating, and, and like nothing happened. You think, okay, uh, I know I'm pretty good at writing. It's just there's nothing happening here. So you know that stuff happens, right? There, there's just a complete mismatch of what you're saying and what the what the what the market's wanting. So so what we do now is we typically create surveys in the front of all our new stuff. So when we iterated from there, stuck them into a survey, asked questions, understood about um, what they wanted, and then we took that new um, intelligence and then recreated the page. And then it, then it literally started working better straight away. Yeah. So what were some of the mismatches then between your mom's story and what they wanted? Um. For the most part, it started off um, as it being like a long-term thing. So it being like a lifestyle change, and people don't necessarily want lifestyle changes; they just want a result right Magic now. Bullet. They they want to wake up in the morning and just be skinny. But these, <laughs> these people are because they were, we we were targeting a very um, elderly um, demographic. They have ailments because of a lifetime of of bad eating. Yeah. So those people are never going to wake up one morning and suddenly be different. Yeah. But that's what they that's what they want, right? So you kind of have to start off with a story and give them what they want and then move them towards you once you've once you've got their attention. Yeah. And then give them what they need. <laughs> yes. You know, another question Andre that I have is, you know, obviously writing the email. And often people say, you know, the people to open the email, you obviously have to have a good subject line. How do you come up with your subject lines? Well, um, I'll tell you the same thing as I tell everybody that, that asks that question. And that is, for the most part, I don't really care because um, the way that I build out all my sequences, um, and, and you've been through All Respond to Madness anyway, so you'll know that there's this thing called soap opera sequences. And, and I have them. So those things start as soon as people add themselves um, to my list. There's there's that process that happens, and then when I know that when when people pop out, let's say for example on day thirty, they now for the most part know like and trust me compared to on day one, then they didn't. So at that day thirty point, um, you know they know that any email that comes from Andre, yeah. it's going to be worth opening and reading. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it. So subject lines are less important later on. Yes. Um, yes. In the beginning, they you kind of want something catchy. Um, some things that I place that I go to is like um, BuzzFeed. Um, so if if you go to BuzzFeed and they've got all these amazing headlines, you can read Cosmopolitan magazine and and you know you can go to any mm-hmm. um, place that sell magazines and just pick up cool headlines. Um, so you use catchy ones in the beginning, but you know later on it really matters far less because you built up. You know, when when a Frank Kern sends an email, people know that it's from Frank Kern, it's and they're going to open it. Yeah, he, he can have any sub- subject line he wants on there. It, it, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. So, do you have any favorites for, for early on for your, in your sequences? Um, surprise! Exclamation mark. Um. I've, I've I've used the the um, f bomb before, so it was just the f bomb with an with an exclamation mark, and that got one one of the highest open rates ever. Wow! <laughs> um, but you can't, you know, not not all markets are you, right. you can't swear. I'm sure, uh, like the paleo women over fifty, you didn't use like an f bomb subject line. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. yeah, then you got to be careful. Uh, when did it hit you to create soap opera sequences? Um, I don't remember the actual point in time, but it was a concept that I was playing around with in my head mm-hmm. uh, because of the way that I was sending emails, and so I was essentially telling stories through board, uh, through through broadcast emails, 
And I thought, well, these, these, these broadcast things aren't that cool because you've got to keep writing them and then sending them. So that's when I, I, I progressed to follow-up sequences because I'm, I'm all about automation. And, and if I can automate something, then that's what I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. And yeah, then I heard about, uh, understood about open loops and I got to understand about story a bit more. And then it was just, it just kind of happened. It's just more natural. It just, you tell a story over many emails. And so what are of, some ways you craft your story that people should be doing? I mean, there's obviously a lot that goes into it, but what's one thing people should definitely be doing when they're crafting their story? Well, okay, so one of the processes is um, figure out what the, what the audience, you know, what, are the, what is their ultimate desire? Um, what is that, that like shiny thing that they want to achieve? And then what are the little elements that, that they're going to need to do to get there? Um, the like small wins, the, the the roadblocks, or the you know those sorts of things, and then you basically use that as a framework to mold your story across. So um, we also big into creating avatars and empathy maps. Mm-hmm. So I have a very good idea of what all the different pain points are of people, what they're going through, what they're doing, if they have a day job, what what it's like, what they do, why they're doing it. Um, so it makes telling the story very, very much easier because now you kind of know what you're going to say because you want to hit all these different pain points and and all these hot buttons along the way. Um, so that's kind of how it it, it starts to get mapped out. Mm-hmm. But I'm not super anal about it. I don't sit there and plan out two months of emails. You you, you can't see that far into the future. Plus, mm-hmm. you have to have feedback loops along the way that yeah. then tell you that you need to go in a certain direction. Um, so I'll probably write in batches of maybe five emails and then I'll put that up there. People will start to go through it and then I'll go back and I'll write another batch of, of emails. So I, I always write them in batches because then you can get into the flow. It's like and a you series. Can, yes. Um, so do you, what are your favorite series to watch? You know, you, you probably study stories. What do you like to, what, what TV shows or? Um, Lost was my favorite back in the day. Mm-hmm. Um, series one and two of Lost was just amazing. Um, the last one got a bit crazy. Um, the first couple of series of, of 24 was also super amazing. They're amazing with, with the loops at the end. Unbelievable. They do it. I mean, uh, the Lost and, and 24 do it really well. Um, Lost was really good because it was just crazy, you know. <laughs> I don't know how to explain it. It's just things were happening all the time, and all these different um, subplots, and 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 that's kind of where, where where I developed some of what I do now. So, for example, one of the things I do is in the PS section, I will I will tell a completely different story. So there'll there'll be a different plot playing out in my PSs, mm. and I I got that from Lost. Um, the one that I'm watching now is is Scandal. That's mm. pretty good. I haven't heard of that. Uh, it's yeah, it's one of your US ones. I think it's on series three at the moment. Okay. So we've so we bulk watched the first two series, and now we are taking series three a bit slower, so we don't kill it all. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I will have to check out Lost because I have not watched that, but many people have recommended it. Yeah, there's there's so many of these things now because um, the networks have realised that. Um, the money is in is in building out these series, you know, like like Game, Game of Thrones has got such a massive follow, uh, following now, mm-hmm. and I think HBO spent like hundreds of millions just on each episode. It's it's wow. a ton of money, but they get all the eyeballs, and um, yeah, it's worth a lot of money. So it's just it's it takes st- uh, storytelling t- to a whole new level. Yeah. You know, you can't go and watch a movie. The best movies out there that you don't watch. It's still going to be over in two hours, but you watch a series and it, that that thing will play out play out over a huge amount of time. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've got a list of of these series that I need to watch, and I haven't got got through What's them all. What's on your list? I'm just trying to find my list now. I finished Breaking Bad not too long ago. Oh yes, actually, uh, bulk. I watched the whole. I, I watched all five series of Breaking Bad in two weeks. <laughs> That's how I am too. <laughs> uh, so on my list, I've got Believe. Um, 
to, uh, tomorrow people, I don't know what that is, almost human, um, Ender's Game, Prisoners, yeah, that's just some of them on, on this list I've got in front of me, yeah. Nice, yeah. See, it's like part of me wants to check them out, but I know that I'm going to spend like, you know, from midnight until six in the morning watching the series the whole week, so I won't be sleeping. Yeah. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. One of the things I do is, uh, is um, I, f um, I found that if I just disconnect um, once once work is finished, so in the evenings, I'll just completely disconnect, and it allows me to be far more focused when I am doing doing work. So I learned that from Tony Schwartz um, in his book, um, which is now um, I can't remember what, 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 what the book's called now, but he talks about the um, your, the ultradian rhythm. So you have this this rhythm that has that happens during the day, and you have to go from these 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 peaks of working, and then you need to back off. So what I do is literally every every ninety minutes, I just come and lie on the bed, or or I'll sit outside, or do something, and I'll just read a chapter of my fiction book. So fiction is completely different from so doing work, different. Right? yeah. And it just allows your 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 mind and your body just to recharge. Yeah. Um, so I do that all, all day long. <laughs> yeah, no, I like that technique. I need to do more of that. Um, so Andre, tell me about a low point, a painful moment, and then a high point, a proud, you know, one of your proudest accomplishments. Um, the low points have always been to do with money. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it's just a guard thing because you you kind of have to be the 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 breadwinner. Yeah. Um, so. The stressful moments have have been when when money's been tight. So, um, in fact, that's probably the only time I ever get stressed. My my wife jokes that I'm just completely relaxed all the time. Uh, Spain is like a perfect you fit for me. You seem like a relaxed guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So long as there's money in the bank, I'm a very relaxed person. So, um, and con uh, conversely, one of the things that motivates me a lot is 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 money. So, um, what's one of the low points? Around money, um, just had just not having enough of it. I think. I mean, when uh, was that? Was there a, t a certain time where that became just uh, all you could think about? It was in the beginning, um, mainly, and also um, shortly after we had we had left the UK and, and moved to Spain, um, uh, we just spent it like like water, and um, didn't plan things out properly. Um, so there was a bit of a, a stressful moment there at, at one point, mm -hmm. but yeah, but thankfully that's that's been it really. So, so tell me one of the proudest moments in business for you. Um, I don't know of a time specifically. I'm afraid, but um, every time when I satisfy my own needs, which is basically my need to to earn money um, and then at the same time help other people move forward so it's a nice win-win so when you do well um, something's worked out really well and you know that people on the other end have really got a massive amount of value from that so one of those it's like me me selling all this one of madness I know that every person that goes through that that goes through the whole course and takes action has you know it 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 completely changes the way that their business operates and and the way that they can generate income, but at the same time it's 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 a nice in income stream for me as well. So mm -hmm. it's kind of win win. It's, it's nice when there's lots of win wins like that. What about teaming up with Mind Valley? Yeah, that's that was cool, and 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 they're like the best people in the world. So um, in fact, we we now go to the as entrepreneur um, A Fest, uh, Awesomeness Fest every year now in November and it's just like a nice it's just it's so chilled out and amazing and you hang out with the like minded people but they're a great company so what um, made you decide to to go with them? Because their values and everything was completely in line with, with the way that I operate. Um, they've just got a, a very big operation and they had they were more resources and at the time we thought that um, it, 
it was perfect for them to take all this modern madness because then they can move it to the next level. They have the resources, and then it would allow us to focus on other projects that we're working on at the time. Yeah. So. And you have a lot of other projects. <laughs> In fact, my 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 business coach says I've have, I've have too many of them. Um, out of out of all his clients, I'm the one that that has the most stuff going on. Um, so we so we're trying to work our way through that and and minimize uh, well. Get, get them down as much as possible so so you mm-hmm. so can focus more but uh, Andre who are some of your mentors and the best advice they've given you um, one of my early mentors not that he he knows it is a Jay Abraham um, I've got a lot of value from from what he said and especially his strategy of preeminence it's kind of been a been a driving force like a philosophy that I that I stick to um, I love listening, uh, reading um, Seth Seth Godin stuff. Um, the guy's just a genius. Um, and then it's just it's just friends, really, just finding the right friends and and connecting with them. Yeah, as, what as colleagues do you do you collaborate with? Um, I don't know. I've just been lucky to find um, good friends um, that all do what I do. Um, everyone's different. Um, you know, some people want to build businesses with with offices and employees, and others just want to do the you know one or two or three um, in, uh, person business. Um, everyone's successful in in their own right, so mm-hmm. it's just nice having having this that pool of people to to be able to bounce ideas off. Um, I think that's that's one of the biggest things. Is early on, I didn't have any of that. You know, there was I was completely operating in a vacuum and there wasn't really back in 2003 there weren't many products to buy that taught people how to do this stuff um, there was no roadmap so yeah um, I definitely feel for people which which is why I respond to emails even now um, if somebody emails me I'm going to reply to that um, so I try my best to sort of reply to emails because back in the day I was emailing all the gurus and I never got one response back from anybody right so I know what it what it feels like mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know Andre, I really appreciate your time. I have one last question for you. Um, but before I ask it, tell people where they can find you, what they should check out online, what you're working on lately. Uh, just type in Andre Shop on into, into Google. And I think uh, m- most of the things will come, will, will, will come up. Um, all, all Respond to Madness um, is, is, is the one is, is the thing that I'm most well known for. And I'm busy working on the next iteration of that now. So. I'm looking forward to seeing that. Um, <laughs> my last question, actually, before I ask it, I have to ask about the whole experiment. So what <laughs> was that in reference to? Um, it was. You thought I was going to forget about that? No. Yeah. <laughs> um, in fact, uh, people that actually get into all this wonder madness, they get to see the whole evil experiment. Um, it's one of the the things that get unlocked. Um, but in a nutshell, is um, I used to have a blog, and on the blog, obviously, um, a place where where people can can sign up to my newsletter. And at the time, my opt-in rate was like twenty percent, which is typical for like a blog where you have the little opt-in box on the side. Um, so yeah, the big shift was this evil experiment. Is I changed the frame, um, so when people try to get onto my list, there was no easy way for them to do that. So I'd instead of it being free to get into my list. Uh, it, it was you either need to buy this product. I think they, there were two options to buy uh, one of these two products and then send me your receipt so that I know you're serious and I also earn a commission. And they weren't my products. Um, there was a third option and then the fourth option was was the loophole. Um, and the loophole was it was still free, but um, they had to go into this um, process where I would... Um, they would have to apply basically and tell me a bit about them and then I would decide within within a few days if they can be on my list. So that whole reframe where it's suddenly now the the um, the perceived value of it was just completely changed, right? Mm-hmm. So they had to either buy a product now or there was the free option but it wasn't still free because they had to jump through hoops mm-hmm. um, and I basically automated that process. So on the very next email once they typed in their their name and email address and the reason why they wanted to join. Um, the very next email says, 
you'll hear from me within two days. If you don't hear with me, uh, hear from me in two days. I'm sorry about your application. You know, you aren't on the list. And I purposely built that thing out. So I think it was five days later. This this email goes out and says, "Okay, you've made it on." So at that point, people have gone crazy. They've they've thought that they haven't made it on. <laughs> then a few days later, they get this email saying, oh, you you've you're on, but you have to get on now." Um, and they had to jump through a final hoop. And yes, those people that came onto my list, it, it actually increased my, my opt-in rate by 30%. So I went from 20% to 50%. Wow. And those people are owned their attention, uh, completely changed the yeah. way that they, yeah. And I did notice that. I noticed this guy is the email guru. I go, I can't, it's hard to get on one of his lists. Like I don't even see a way to get on it sometimes. So yeah, yeah I definitely did notice that. Yeah, I'm, I'm always trying to make uh, ways, lots of marketers, and again, there's no right or wrong way of doing any of this stuff because it, mm. all of it works, yeah. but I'm, I'm of, the, of, the mind, of the mind frame that I want it to be, not necessarily be easy for somebody to get into my list. So mm. some marketers will say, on your opt-in form, just have the email address and, and, and a submit button and you'll, and you'll increase your opt-in rate, which you will. But what what you don't hear is you're gonna get a lot of bad email addresses. You won't necessarily own their attention. They they click and submit to get whatever the the freebie thing is. Um, so they'll put a dud email address inside there just to get the the the, the object. Yeah. Whereas the way that I reframe things, it's it's I typically don't bribe people to get into my list. They normally have to jump through hoops to get into my list, yeah. and people just become far more responsive by by doing that. You might get less of them. But they're still better people to have. Yeah, I love that reframe, Andre. Thanks for sharing that. <laughs> You're yeah, welcome. That was worth the wait. If anyone, you know, actually listened to the whole, all your valuable insights, that alone is golden. So thank you. So you So Andre, since this is Inspired Insider, you know, my question is, what do you think about that inspires and motivates you when times are tough? To push forward when money was tight to push forward. Um. Well, the one thing is, I've, I've told myself that I'm never ever going to go back and get a job. So, in, in my mind, I've burnt that bridge, and I've um, ages ago I never allowed myself to ever think about going back. So it's always been you have to make this work. There's just no other way around it. Um, so in the beginning, that was that worked really well because there was no option B or plan B. There was only a plan A, and the plan A was just to hustle and make it work, and um, kind of worked out. So, what were you picturing in your mind that was so painful that you would just burn that bridge? You're like I'm never doing that. I don't know. I think maybe I was just lucky or fortunate. I don't know if. If that's the right answer, but I just had this this uh, burning. I just knew that it would work out. There was just this crazy belief that I had, and certainly in the beginning there was there was no foundation behind that. It was like I, I I didn't know what I was doing, but there was this belief, and um, I just I just knew that at some point it it would work out because that's the way things work, right? <laughs> what was that? Where did that belief come from, though? Was it just? I know I'm smart enough I can make anything work or I saw this person do it or I remember this other person did it and I can do it too. What was what was going through your mind that yeah, gave you that confidence? That, I, 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 I knew people were making it work. I've never considered myself to be the smartest person out there. So it's like, well, I'm smarter than them. I can do this. I don't ever see that. I don't always look at it that way because I don't really understand or, or know how smart somebody else is. Right. And they probably are smarter than me anyway. So it's more that... <laughs> I know other people have are doing this, and it's just a matter of being persistent. And a lot of people that don't get success are the ones that are bailed out just before mm -hmm. they potentially going to get that success. It's it's almost easier to quit than it is to 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 forge forward. Um, it's harder to go forward, especially when 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 things are tough. Yeah. So yeah, it's just just to roll that dice and have the guts to just to. Just to do it. Yeah. I'm just wondering where that persistence and hustle comes from. Like a lot of times you hear when it's so painful, like money drives people, they usually grow up in like a really, they don't, they grow up with a lot. And so they always felt that need to 
um, I don't know if it's compensate or just to produce a lot. What was it for you that creates this hustle and persistence? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I wasn't fortunate enough to, to to be born into money at all. So um, it's always been been a hustle, I guess. Um, it's just my desire to never have to never work for a boss. I think. I, I guess that's that's deep down. It's, it's I, I don't want to be part of the system and work in a cubicle. Um, I mean, did you see that with your dad complaining about that, or or what? Yeah, he was just a person that from the day that he finished school, he he got into the hospital services and he and he spent his, his entire life there until he retired. Hmm. So he's he's of the he's old school, you know. He's those people that you get a job and you stay and you stay at a job for the rest of your life. Right. I think those those days are long gone. They don't exist anymore. Hmm. I don't think anybody can, can can have a job, even if they wanted to keep it forever. Hmm. You know. I'm just wondering um, if there was one experience you had with a boss that it's so painful. You're like, I would never, I never want to spend my time in a cubicle. No, nah, I've just always had this, 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 this feeling that knew. that everything's temporary um, while I was working. So for those 11 years while I was working, or however many years it was, um, I just knew that it it was all temporary. <laughs> I obviously didn't know at which point it was going to become less temporary, but. Um, it was going to happen at some point. Yeah. No, I appreciate you sharing that and all your insights. Andre, it's been an absolute pleasure. And anything, anything I didn't ask you that you think would be important to mention or any story that like Jeremy, I need to share this with the audience. Um, I think one of the most inspirational books I've read is, um, um, turning pro, um, there's there's also do the work, and the third one is um, the War of Art. Yeah, all, all from the same author. But um, I think his latest one, uh, Turning Pro, is just uh, it's a it's a short, easy read, and it, it's just so motivating. Um, I hate reading. I battle to read business books for the simple fact that I've got to work my way through three or four hundred pages. Of stuff that they could have really summed it down um, down into like five pages. Just just give me the facts. Right. Whereas the Turning Pro book, every single page, which is short, or well, the pages are short, it's just all amazing insights. There's there's nothing he could have taken out and made that book any shorter. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I enjoyed reading that. Otherwise, the other big insight for me is reading fiction. But that's because I write. So, what fiction would you tell people to start with? What do you like? Well, I'm I'm dyslexic and I can't read really? and write pretty much. Yeah, uh, sorry, I I didn't mention that. No. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, there was some so, article on people like a high number of uh, successful founders or CEOs are dyslexic. Yeah, I had a hard time growing up, um, and yeah, I went to to a special school at one point because I was like slow. You know, um, in terms of I couldn't, I was a really bad reader. In fact, I still am a bad reader. Um, I don't read fast, um, and I can't spell. Like I can't spell at all. So mm-hmm. thank God for for auto spellers. Um, but so because of that reason, I never read read any books. So my first book that I read since leaving school, and even at school, I never ever read one book cover to cover. I used to just hustle. I used to read the the back page of the book. And then maybe one, one, uh, like a few pages of, of of every chapter, and then just make up the story. And that's how I used to do my my book reviews. Wow! But my very first book I read was when I was thirty five years old. I'm forty one now, so really? just a few years ago. And wow. since since that day, it's obviously changed the way that, that I write. And I've I've since read hundreds and hundreds of books, but they're all fiction books. Almost all of them are fiction books. Really. So what do you uh, like? So the first book I read was um, Persuader by Lee Child. And it completely, it was like the most amazing thing ever. It's, it's influenced my writing more, more so than, than any copywriting book I've ever read. Wow. And it's just a fiction book. It's just the way that he writes, his, his writing style just resonated with me instantly. And I ended up reading all the books in that series in, like, in, in no time. And I'm, like, like I said, I'm a slow reader. <laughs> so it takes me a while to get, yeah. to get through a book. So did you, up to that point, listen to audio, or what did you do? Yeah, I, I listened to Audible books. But yeah, again, I love I, Audible. Yeah, me too. And also, the reason why I buy lots of Audible now is 
I can listen to uh, stuff at uh, two times the speed. Yeah, I listen to so three times. Yeah, <laughs> some things you you can go up to three times, and yeah. which is good for me because no matter how fast I try and read, I can't read at two speed. Right? No possible way. No, so it's it's good that I can I can get through a book quickly. So I typically get all my business books as as audible because yeah. I find it difficult to read business books. Yeah. Um, but then fiction books, I want to read those things, so I just get them all on Kindle and I'll and, and I'll read them. It doesn't matter if if it takes three weeks to read a book, you know, it's still I'm getting a massive amount of enjoyment from from reading it, and it's all about the storytelling and stuff. So, yeah, um, just read lots of fiction, now, even though I'm a bad reader and I can't spell. I am not a good reader either. Um, how did you adapt with being dyslexic? Because that's I don't hard know. to go through school. I mean to you go through everything with things getting jumbled. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I've just never been able to spell. I mean, uh, and even at at matric, which is where, which which is like the last the last year of school. Um, even then, when we had um, spelling tests and spelling stuff, the um, I used to literally get zero out of twenty on spelling tests, and the teacher. She said, "This guy's just like jerking off. He's just like he's just making this stuff up because it, it's impossible to be that bad." But yeah, I was I was that bad. Um, my my wife's um, she's Bulgarian, and she she moved to South Africa when she was thirteen years old, and she couldn't speak a word of English. Wow. Um, she's now obviously speaks fluent English, and she's got a South African accent. She learned English in South Africa. But I actually ask her, "How do I spell this? How do I spell that?" And she's she breaks. Just, but in, in my head, when I'm trying to spell out words, you know, obviously all the easy ones I, I can get. But there's there's words that I can sit there, and even the actual spell checker can't figure it out. So then I'll go to Google and I'll go to Google search, and then um, if you type in a, a, a misspelled word in Google search. You typically get the right answer because it's had so many people. Right, it like auto it. fills into what you want. Yeah. So Google search is actually way better than than any. Um, that's spell a good point. Yeah. So that's what I end up using. That's crazy, Andre. So you're dyslexic, and pretty much all day you're writing. Yeah, it's the strangest thing, isn't it? How did that happen? So I mean, yeah. If I can do it, anybody can do it, right? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. Andre, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. I hope that one day I will uh, get to meet you face to face. Maybe it's at Oceans. Maybe it's somewhere else. I'm in Chicago. What's... You'll let me know if you're ever in Chicago. Okay. Yes. Yes. I've never been to Chicago, but uh, absolutely. Or we'll be going to Spain. My wife did study there for uh, for a year, so we'll eventually be going back. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but thank you so much, Andre. I appreciate it. You're welcome, man.